Hello, everybody. I'm back with uh, Ian Ziskin. Uh, Ian is the president of Exec Excel Group. Uh, he's going to talk about developing and transforming yourself as an entrepreneurial leader. And uh, Ian, uh, you've, you've, you've worked with us in the past at, at, at the leading entrepreneurs of the world. It's a pleasure listening to you and look forward to it today. Great to be with you, Jeff. And uh, thanks, everybody, for the opportunity to spend some time with you today. Uh, what I want to do is maybe kick off a little bit with uh, one of the, a quote, I think, sets the tone for uh, the conversation that we're going to have uh, from Seneca, who's actually an ancient Roman philosopher and politician uh, who was famous for saying, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And uh, one of the things I found valuable about that is it's really not about luck at all. And the stage of life and career, I think that perhaps many of you are at, so often is about meeting the opportunity that presents itself with being uh, properly prepared. Uh, and by prepared in this particular case for the time that we're gonna be spending together today, the focus is really on what are you doing to prepare yourself, to invest in yourself, uh, to make your own luck. Uh, as part of that, let me just give you a, a minute or two's background on me so you know um, the perspective that I'm coming from and uh, maybe a few of my biases so that we can make this as conversational as, as possible. I'm not going to be using any charts, which I think will be a little bit different from some of the presenters you've uh, heard from already today. So uh, we'll take a little bit of a break from that and try to make it as conversational as we can. Uh, my background basically is uh, 40 years in, in one way or another in the human resources and leadership field. So think of that in two chunks. I spent the first 28 years of my career working for large companies. For the latter part of my corporate life, I was the chief human resources officer for two companies. And then about 12 years ago, uh, the entrepreneurial side of me really started to pop out and I founded my own coaching and consulting firm. You know, if you look at the combination of all the things that I've been doing over the course of the last 40 years, almost all of it is in one way or another connected to uh, helping leaders at all levels be as effective uh, as they possibly can be. So I'm going to share with you today in the, the time that we've got a few perspectives and lessons learned from working with and learning from literally thousands of leaders. Uh, fortunately, most of whom you would put in the category of being highly successful and uh, some who were not so successful and there's lessons to be learned from them as well. I also have found uh, these last 12 years or so running my own business, not only becoming an entrepreneur myself, but also serving on some boards of directors and advisory boards for uh, highly entrepreneurial startup kinds of companies. There's some things to be learned from you know, what's worked and what hasn't worked. And I'll try to share with you some points of view on all of those things. Basically, we're gonna focus on three things today. Uh, one would be having a better handle on what you want to be known for as a leader uh, and the importance of being able to articulate that in a clear way. The second thing is taking a, a bit better control of your own development destiny, particularly because uh, I think being an entrepreneurial leader like so many of you are uh, can be a lonely business at times. Uh, and then finally, what I'd like to do uh, toward the latter part of our conversation is to share with you some nuggets and lessons learned from uh, a new book that I'm the lead author of that's coming out actually on June 1st, so fairly timely, called The Secret Sauce for Leading Transformational Change. And we'll pick up a couple of the themes from that that may have uh, particularly stronger applicability for uh, those of you in the entrepreneurial leadership space. But before we get into um, all of that, let's take a step back to uh, the first topic that I mentioned we should spend a little bit of time on. And that is getting some clarity for yourself and others around you about what you want to be known for uh, as a leader. Some of the presenters that you uh, heard from earlier this morning 
talked about it in the context of uh, storytelling and the importance of storytelling or the importance of leadership brand. Uh, my way of thinking about it is personal leadership philosophy. What's important to you as a leader? Uh, how do you want to be coming across to other people? Uh, to what degree do those other individuals understand what you stand for uh, and what your personal leadership philosophy is? And there's really basically uh, four principles around this that I'd like to emphasize. They're quite simple uh, to think about, but probably more difficult to do. One is to spend a little bit of time for yourself thinking about what you want to be known for as a leader, not only for yourself, but also by others. Uh, the second thing, uh, simple as it seems, is the importance of writing it down in order to get some clarity for yourself and how to best position yourself uh, as a leader and what you want to be known for. The third thing is to actually tell other people what it is that you want to be known for. What is your personal leadership philosophy? Express it, articulate it. Don't keep it a secret because it's not very valuable uh, if nobody else actually knows what it is. Uh, and by the way, uh, telling other people uh, what you want to be known for as a leader is a great accountability builder because once you publicly disclose it, uh, there's a much higher likelihood that you'll do the fourth and final thing very well. And that is to behave in a way, to operate in a way as a leader that's consistent with the things you say you want to be known for as a leader. It's a way of holding yourself accountable but it's also a way of other people who are around you being able to hold you accountable for that set of behaviors as well. And I would put uh, everything that I'm describing so far into the bucket of uh, the importance of intentionality. Uh, there's another quote I like uh, quite a bit uh, from those of you who've been around the, the acting and comedy scene for a very long time. Uh, the uh, woman Lily Tomlin, great actress, great comedian, is probably in her 80s by now, was famous uh, for saying, I've always wanted to be somebody, but now I see I should have been more specific. Uh, and for me, it's really all about the intentionality of uh, how am I going to position myself as a leader to be clear about how I want to come across to other people. Just as an example, what I'll do is take a, a minute or two and share with you my own personal leadership philosophy. Before I do, I want to emphasize that I'm simply providing it uh, to you as an example of how you might think about articulating your own. There's nothing in here that's magical. Uh, if you find something that's useful, please feel free to steal it shamelessly. But the most important aspect is being uh, as crisp and clear as you can be about how you want to come across to others as a leader. Uh, for me, I put them all into the bucket of what I described as the four C's, which would be credibility, collaboration, courage, and competence. And let me just take a, a minute to explain a little bit more about each of those. So for, for credibility, uh, to me, it's really all about, um, do you do what you say you will do? Uh, and uh, in my case, as somebody who's grown up working around um, the human resources field and leaders in general, uh, it also includes, do you have the ability uh, and willingness to keep confidential information confidential so that when people come to you with an issue or a problem uh, that requires a certain degree of confidentiality, they don't have to worry about uh, being blabbed all over the place. Uh, the second thing around uh, collaboration for me personally is quite important. I, I put this uh, in, the, in, the, in the way of defining it as, do you have a willingness to share resources, information, and talent for the betterment of the organization and its mission, uh, even when, and perhaps even particularly when, uh, it's difficult and inconvenient for you to do so? So credibility, collaboration, those are two things that are really important to me. Third one uh, is courage. I define this simply as the willingness to push back on things that don't make sense and push forward on the things that do. You know, in other words, you know, are you willing to take a stand on difficult uh, or unpopular or complicated topics that need somebody to uh, push back against them if they're 
um, unethical, illegal, immoral, just plain bad business? Uh, and likewise, are you willing to take a stand and advocate for people and ideas and issues uh, that um, may require somebody to have the, the bravery or the courage to stand up and advocate for those things, uh, even if they're unpopular or difficult? Uh, and then the final uh, fourth C, if you will, is competence, which for me has a lot to do with, do you understand what you're really good at? Are you willing to surround yourself with other people who are better than you uh, at the things that you're not as good at? Uh, and to what degree do you take uh, responsibility for sharpening your own tools and your toolkit and learning and developing yourself, which turns out to be, I think, in, in many ways, a common theme of quite a few of the, the presentations that, that I heard uh, from uh, our time together uh, throughout the day today. Uh, and it's certainly, uh, from my experience, one of the most important things you can do in piecing together your own uh, investment in yourself as a leader is to understand what you're good at, surround yourself with other people who are better than you at certain things and take responsibility for your own ongoing development, which is really the second uh, theme that I wanna share with you today as part of this time together uh, is this concept of controlling your own de development destiny. I, the entrepreneurs that I spend a, a lot of time around, I find this to be a particularly important factor in success, why? because so often being an entrepreneur is a lonely uh, and sometimes isolating business. Uh, and you know, most of us who've learned a lot about leadership have had the benefit, I certainly have in my career, of being surrounded by role models and mentors and others who we can learn from. Uh, I think in an entrepreneurial environment, particularly when you're starting out earlier in your career, uh, that's a, a very difficult, set of resources to find and get your arms around. So there's a, a lot of ways of, uh, I think for me, taking control of your own development destiny turns out to be an essential uh, capability. What I'd like you to think about is just to kind of visualize or write down on a piece of paper, if you have one in front of you, uh, a very simple triangle. And the triangle has you know three dimensions to it, as, as most triangles do. Uh, one would be the question of what? The second would be the question of who, and the third would be the question of when. And let me explain a little bit what I mean about each of these. Uh, when you think about what, this would be the kinds of capabilities, the things you need to know and do in order to be a highly successful entrepreneur uh, and leader, uh, getting your arms around things like technology and product and service and strategy and operations and the financials and going out and raising capital and sales and marketing, and also uh, all the things you have to do to uh, hire and keep good talent uh, and lead folks uh, in that environment. That's a, a partial list of many of the things that all of you who are um, entrepreneurs either have to do now today uh, or are gonna find yourselves facing over the coming years. And all of those things are essential to master, but in my experience, they're the things that people almost exclusively focus on when they think about their own development, uh, usually to the detriment of two other dimensions of development, which are uh, equally important, uh, and that would be who uh, and when. So I'm going to talk about uh, those two now for a couple of minutes. The second side of the triangle has to do with this question of who. And what I mean by that is, who do you need to be interacting with, spending time around, and learning from, particularly as you make the transition from being a individual contributor, technical expert with a great idea as an entrepreneur, to somebody who's got to adapt more of a general management mentality and mindset uh, and frankly, a, a CEO mentality and mindset as you're running your own business. And the transition that folks typically go through with this kind of environment that's particularly difficult in an entrepreneurial setting, in my experience, is 
you, you generally need to become more externally focused. Uh, you need to have the ability to think in a cross-functional, much more multidisciplinary way than perhaps uh, you learned about in school or have been asked to do at the earlier stages of your career. That almost by definition means that you also have to become more networked and more collaborative with all kinds of people that you haven't previously worked with before. Uh, this puts a, a bit of pressure on you to spend actually less time being reliant on people you already know, who you have well-established and, and trust-based relationships with, and more time with new people uh, who you haven't worked with before. Uh, and you also have to kind of begin to let go of some of the technical things that got you to where you are earlier in your career and begin to uh, expand those out to a broader set of general management capabilities, not to mention uh, working with uh, boards of directors uh, and, and investors uh, as you continue to build out uh, your business. So one question you ought to be asking yourself uh, as you're hearing me say these words is, you know, am I spending most, if not all of my time as an entrepreneur with people I already know well? Uh, if the answer is yes, you're already falling behind, you know, where you need to be as an entrepreneur. Uh, and I'm going to strongly encourage you to uh, begin to broaden out your network in a way that's much more working up and across uh, multiple functions and multiple businesses and outside of your own organization and outside of your traditional network of friends and colleagues who you're already comfortable with. The third piece of the triangle has to do with the question when. Uh, and what I tend to uh, think about when I, when I ask this question is really, what are the critical developmental inflection points that you need to be paying attention to and learning from in the moment as they're happening to you? Uh, for example, um, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, a lot of time and effort gets put into startup and startup mentality and how am I going to build my business from scratch and it's very exciting it's very creative it's very innovative it's very energizing sometimes that can be a lot more fun than taking a business that's uh, broken or falling apart and needs to be fixed and needs to be turned around uh, but there's all kinds of other experiences that we find over the course of our careers which are foundational in terms of building a base and a variety of experience whether it's uh, doing an M&A uh, deal or, or 10 to try to build your business or becoming familiar with uh, new uh, functional areas or new technologies that you're not previously experienced in or getting some geographically broader experience going from a country specific strategy to a global strategy as an example. Uh, all of these things that I'm mentioning and, and many more that we don't have the time to talk about today are all part of taking control of your development destiny and learning from the variety of experience with the, the heavy emphasis on the word variety being really important here. Uh, here's how I tend to think about it. In addition to working with a lot of entrepreneurs in early stage companies, I also work around a lot of senior level leaders in Fortune 500 companies. And one of the things that's very common I discover uh, in all of these environments is people very proudly telling me, uh, you know, I've got 30 years of experience in this business and I've learned a ton. Uh, and that's all great, except when you peel back the onion, what you really begin to discover is they have one year of experience 30 times. They have basically been doing essentially the same thing with the same level of expertise, relying on the same set of skills, working around the same people, on the same kinds of problems and challenges for their entire careers. And they may very well be uh, expert at those things. And that's great. And I take nothing away from them, but they're not very broadly experienced people. Uh, and so I'd like to encourage you, particularly if you are uh, at an earlier stage in your career, uh, trying to build a business as an entrepreneur, not to undersell or undervalue the importance of the broad base of variety experience coupled with you know, spending time with the right kinds of people who you can learn from in a multidisciplinary, cross-functional, in many ways, external way 
outside of your immediate circle uh, and, and tight set of relationships that you've historic, historically had and make sure that you have a good balance between the, the what you're supposed to know and do along with who you're supposed to be spending your time with and those critical developmental inflection points which are part of your ongoing development. It's a balanced perspective around that triangle that I think is particularly important. The third thing that I mentioned that I wanted to talk about today uh, in the time that we've got together are a few lessons learned from this new book that I've had the great privilege of being the lead author on called The Secret Sauce for Leading Transformational Change. And this is a book that um, when it comes out at the beginning of June, really tends to focus on what are the lessons learned around uh, large scale transformational change at the individual team and organizational levels, uh, which also have in many cases implications for society as well. Uh, if you want to learn more about the uh, book, then I'll be able to share with you today. You can go to the book website, which is www.transformationalchangebook, all one word, dot com. But for purposes of uh, the time we have today, I just want to give you a couple of uh, nuggets that have come out of putting this book together, particularly as it relates to you as um, young entrepreneurs. One of those nuggets from the secret sauce, if you will, as we put it together for the book, is what I describe in the book as go first, but not alone. Uh, and what we mean by that is um, as an effective leader, uh, particularly in an entrepreneurial environment, you have to be comfortable with transforming yourself first before you expect other people to change, which also means uh, leading by example, being a good role model, setting the tone for uh, others around you, even if it's a small uh, group of people that you've got responsibility for leading. It also means the importance of traveling in packs. So the most successful leaders of transformational change that I've been around are people who don't do it by themselves. They may go first, they may set the tone, but they're very conscious of the importance of surrounding themselves with other highly capable people uh, who can make the journey with them. A second important learning that I want to leave you with for today is what I describe in the book as define, align, and refine the what and why. Uh, and this has a lot to do with setting the, uh, the vision for the organization that you're building to achieve mission clarity, but it also has a lot to do with uh, being disciplined enough to measure success along the way and hold people accountable. And finally, uh, the refinement part of what we've learned is the extraordinary importance of recognizing the need to adjust course along the way and that whatever the initial plans are that you may have set for yourself, uh, they may work, but guess what? They may not work. Uh, and if they don't, uh, you have to make some adjustments along the way. Uh, and then the final point I want to leave you with for today that came out of the book, which really, um, you know, struck me as I was pulling the book together, was a, a concept that I describe as love influencers and resistors. Uh, and this is particularly important, I find, in working with uh, highly entrepreneurial people, because uh, most great entrepreneurs are extremely passionate, as they should be. Uh, about their product and service and the mission uh, of the organization that they're building. And that's all great. However, uh, it can't rest and stop with you, know, you uh, as the leader of the organization. It also needs to be heavily supported by, influenced by, enabled by other people at every layer of the organization, whether it's big uh, or small. And it's true, in fact, that change leaders can be found at every level of the organization in every role, irrespective of whether their job or job title uh, declares that they are in fact a leader. You also will encounter, I think a lot in trying to build your business and sell your concept 
to the external marketplace and to investors as well, you'll encounter both um, the influencers who can be helpful, but also people who are highly resistant. Think of these individuals as skeptics. Uh, however, turns out uh, in writing the book, we discovered that a lot of these skeptics, you know, really need to be treated as truth seekers who are trying to make sure that what's being done, you know, makes good sense uh, rather than as enemies. And uh, the quicker you can get out of the mindset of people who are resistant to what you're trying to build or sell as being the enemy, uh, the faster you're going to be in a position of being able to eventually convert them to positive influencers and enablers of what you're trying to um, achieve. So I think in the final analysis, I'll, I'll finish up by suggesting to you that uh, in all the things that we've talked about in our time together, uh, it really all comes back to you and taking some degree of control over your own development destiny, because frankly, you're probably spending 100 hours a week trying to figure out how to build your business and take a, a concept from ideation to execution and implementation. And that's all great, but none of it happens without having the appropriate capability and mindset of a successful entrepreneurial leader. Uh, and I hope that a few of the nuggets that we've uh, had the opportunity to talk about today uh, will help you on that journey. So I'll stop there. I'll see if there are any questions or comments that uh, come up out of the chat or uh, Jeff, if you had something that you wanted to ask about before we wrap things up. Sure, well, thank you. Um, yeah, a couple of things came to mind. I mean, one, um, how would you say has, Leadership in itself, the concept, the a philosophy of leadership, which, as you talked about yours, it's a very, it's it's a great type of philosophy to have, right? I mean, uh, everyone's for co being courageous, and everybody wants to be credible and be honest and have integrity and all those things you talk about. But but culturally, socially, how has leadership changed over the years? And does does a philosophy of leadership actually change over time as social changes happen in our world in terms of the kind of people we have? And, and how would you encapsulate the, the philosophy changing? Yeah, yeah, that's, I appreciate that, that question. I think it's got several different tentacles to it. Um, one is the, the whole definition of leadership in my experience has changed substantially uh, because it's become much less hierarchical, much less power-based, much more distributed, shared, collaborative, where you're, um, you know, basically you're trying to get things done through influence and persuasion, as opposed to a long history of, you know, I tell you what to do and you right. salute and you just go do it. Um, it's a very different environment, uh, certainly over the last, uh, you know, five to 10 years, even further proved out, by the way, in the last two years by uh, COVID. Uh, and now uh, the great resignation and people giving up jobs and companies trying to figure out how to get people to come back to the office with quite a few people saying, I have no interest in coming back to the office. I want to work remotely. So I think we're all recognizing as leaders, we don't have quite as much um, uh, you know, power as traditionally defined uh, over people. And then the last part of your question, very quickly, I'll simply say your personal leadership philosophy does and should evolve to some degree, not completely, but does not should evolve over time as you recognize what's happening in the changing nature of work, the workforce and the workplace, because those three constituencies uh, all have different expectations of leaders and different yeah. demands of leaders uh, than they would have had you know, 20 years ago or certainly 40 years ago when I started my career. Yeah, that's great. I, I look, you know, work, having worked at a very big company and, and seeing how things work, you know, with, with, with top management, with what they intend, and sometimes what ends up happening when it filters through all the levels of management. I'm looking forward to, 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 uh, to seeing your book and reading about, about transformation. Uh, many try to transform and they do. And then again, it's, it's not an easy process. So I look forward to reading about it. Um, thanks a lot, Ian. It was, it was great. It was great having you. And great to be with you. Thanks, Jeff. Time. Appreciate the invitation. Enjoy the rest of the conference, everyone. Appreciate you being here. Thanks, Ian. Bye.